Open your Bibles then. (laughs) Title of the message this morning, Sacrifice and Atonement. Sacrifice and Atonement. I love this part of God's plan of redemption that we are six messages into. Look at these chapters, and I'm just telling you right now, write these chapters down. I'm going to tell you three times in this message, write these chapters down. Genesis 22, Leviticus 16, and Hebrews 9 and 10, kind of halfway through 9 and halfway through 10. Incredible. The Probably the three most powerful chapters in the Bible on the subject of sacrifice and atonement. Atonement. So what have we seen so far in God's plan of redemption? Well, we saw creation and God made it all good, right? God made it all good. And then as soon as creation was over, inner sin, the fall of man in the garden, and uh, it looks bad, but God has a plan even in Genesis chapter 3. And God's plan gets started with Abraham. He starts his plan of redemption with a relational covenant with one man, Abraham. And then, after that relational covenant with Abraham, uh, enter Moses and God's covenant with his people through Moses, otherwise known as the law. So connect the dots for me. It's important. Creation, the way it was meant to be. The fall, enter sin into mankind. God's relational covenant with a man, a sinful man, Abraham. And then right behind that relational covenant with Abraham, God delivers the law which reveals his holiness and man's sinfulness. Here's the question we have to ask, and here's the question we're going to answer today. How can God both make a covenant of relationship with a sinful man and make a covenant of the law which clearly shows God's radical holiness and the separation that sin causes. Let me restate it. How can God's holiness and man's sinfulness ever be reconciled? How can God make a relational covenant with Abraham if Abraham's a sinner and God's perfectly holy? God, how do you fix that? What's your plan to maintain this covenant relationship intimacy with sinful man How can we be in a right relationship with a holy and just and a perfect God? Today we see the answer to that question. How does God enable, how are we enabled to have a right relationship with a holy God when we are sinful creatures? Ready to to figure it out? I know you already know, right? You're like, we know this. (sighs) Just, you know, play Donkey Kong then for the next 45 minutes. Uh, on your phone. No. If you know this already, do you know this? Do you know where I'm going? I'm just, I just need some response today. Okay, because I'm, I'm teaching you some basic theological tenets of the faith today. And, and so I'm a little nervous because this is like, you know, this is like theology 101. You know, this isn't the simple stuff. So just bear with me. I want you to see how God makes this right. Okay, you ready now? All right, let's pray then. Heavenly Father, please, show us, Lord. Show us, God, that a sinful man can't have a right relationship with a holy God without you, God, doing something about it. That we are separated from you without hope unless you do something to correct it. And so we pray today, God, that you would just crystallize in our mind what you've done to enable a sinful mankind to have a right relationship with a holy and a perfect God. That's our focus today. That's our desire today, Lord. We pray you'd give us a sure answer from your word and by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me just state it real clear. The MIP. God's solution to our problem of sin is sacrifice and atonement. Most literally, God's solution to our problem of sin is substitutionary sacrifice and atonement. So those are really big words, so just grasp them. Because really, honestly, when I start talking to Christians about about sacrifice and atonement, they go, oh yeah, Jesus, right? Really? (laughs) Really? 
it's very seldom, very seldom when I talk to a Christian about God's plan for substitutionary sacrifice and atonement, very, very seldom does a, new, does a Christian talk about the Old Testament, right? I mean, you're probably thinking that too. I, yeah, I know, I know about that, Jesus, right? No, not, not, it didn't start with Jesus. Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan of substitutionary sacrifice and atonement. But listen, we as Christians, our Bible does not start in Matthew. Our Bible starts in Genesis where God's plan of redemption started. And it's so critically important that we see God's plan of redemption as one plan, one story. The Old Testament and the New Testament dovetail perfectly together. And so if we just are like, yeah, 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 Jesus, you know, the whole cross thing. I've heard it since I was eight. Well, no, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. The plan that God put into place in Genesis to enable you to have a right relationship with him, will, it will immeasurably multiply the impact of Jesus Christ on your life if you understand that this plan started in Genesis. Do you follow me? This is what some people would call a Jewish perspective on Christ or on a New Testament theology. I just want you to see it as one whole message. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was no whim decision. God didn't take the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and New Testament and go, well, what should I do now? You know, I think I'll try this. It, it didn't happen. God's plan for Jesus Christ was, Revelation says, before the foundation of the world, but his plan was enacted from Genesis. You'd say, Genesis, you'd say, how far back, Dave? I'd say the Garden of Eden. I'd say Genesis chapter 3. As soon as sin entered mankind, what did Adam and Eve do to try to cover the shame of their sin? They used fig leaves, right? What did God do for them to cover the shame of their sin? He sacrificed an innocent life. An innocent life was taken so that the shame of the sin of Adam and Eve could be covered with animal skins. That's how far back sacrifice and atonement goes. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 4, the very next chapter, right after, right after God sacrifices a life to cover the sin of Adam and Eve, in the very next chapter, we know that sacrifice has become an, an, an instrumental activity in the people of God. Why? Because it is surrounding the sacrifice of God that caused Cain to kill Abel. It was all about sacrifice. So we know that sacrifice was an important part of God's people in Genesis chapter 4 because Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's sacrifice was rejected, and the jealousy and the anger that that caused in Cain caused him to kill his brother Abel. So that's how far back the concept of sacrifice and atonement goes. And just a little bit of a side note, which is so cool that Patrick prayed that scripture in Malachi that says where God says, I wish somebody would close the doors and prevent the people from sacrificing. Do you know why that? Did you hear him pray that during the offering? You don't realize this, but I had that scripture in my notes. I had that scripture in my notes right here, and I usually cut out about a third. You, you're going to say, no, there's no way, Dave, you cut it. I do. I cut about a third of my original notes out in order to pack this message into the time frame, but that's part of what I cut out. The God in, in the Italian prophet's book, the book of Malachi, uh, you know that book, right? Okay, in, in, in the book of Malachi, God says, listen, I wish someone would shut the doors and prevent my people from sacrificing to me. And if you read that section, you're going to go, I can't believe what he says next. Because he threatens to, he threatens to rub the dung of the sacrifice in the face of the people. Because their hard attitude sickens him so much in their religious ceremonial activities. It's really brutal and... Um, I had to take it out, but now I put it back in because Patrick prayed it. 
That's what happened back with Cain and Abel. It's not that Cain sacrificed that he went through the wrong motions, that his heart was wrong. God says your heart's wrong. Be careful, sin's crouching at the door, and, and it will ensnare you. And, and it did, because of the jealousy, he killed his brother Abel. That was a little side note. The point is, sacrifice and atonement starts in Genesis. So we continue in Genesis, and you have to see the, the certainly... Certainly the best text in the book of Genesis, if not the entire Old Testament, of substitutionary sacrifice. It's in Genesis chapter 22. Let's go there. Substitutionary sacrifice. It seems like two big words, but, but here's what it means. It's a sacrifice in place of another life. So it's one life sacrificed in place of another. Genesis chapter 22. The details of the sacrificial system and atonement weren't given until Leviticus. That's where we're really heading today. But Israel, God's people, even before there was Israel, God's people knew long before Leviticus and Moses, they knew about substitutionary sacrifice. How did they learn? Well, here's a little picture about substitutionary sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22 Verse 1. Do you remember? You remember, right, from like three or four messages ago that God promised Abraham to make a great nation out of his, his only son, his true son, Isaac? You remember that whole thing, right? So God had promised that over and over to Abraham. So we read in Genesis 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham. Now, we know God was testing Abraham, but did Abraham know? Say no. Abraham did not, K-N-O-W, right? Abraham did not know that he was being tested. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Verse two, he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Excuse me? What did you just say? Did God just tell the father of the faith to sacrifice his only son? Yeah, he sure did. God was testing Abraham. Abraham didn't know. Verse 2, take your only son whom you love. Take your only son, the father of the faith, is required to take his only son whom he loves and sacrifice him where? On Mount Moriah, it's very significant language, here's why. On Mount Moriah, there's a ridge. At the, near the top of that ridge, eventually, a great city was built by King David. That city is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built on the ridge called Mount Moriah. Near the top of that ridge is a threshing floor where Solomon, David's son, eventually built the temple. So Mount Moriah is the place where Jerusalem's built, the flat spot where the temple's built, and then there's a little bit of a ridge to the north from the temple. The highest point on Mount Moriah is the place that we call Golgotha, Calvary. The father of the faith is told by God to take his only son to Mount Moriah where one day our heavenly father will take his only son. And God tells Abraham, sacrifice him there. Can't get much more significant than that, right? Verse 3 of Genesis 22. So Abraham rose early in the morning. Abraham did it. He got up the next morning and he left. Here's why. Because Abraham believed God more than he believed his circumstances. Abraham trusted the promise of God no matter what. And right there next to Genesis 22.3 in your Bible, write Hebrews 11.9. Write Hebrews 11.9 next to Genesis 22.3 because Hebrews 11.9 says that Abraham had faith that God was able even to raise his son from the dead in order to accomplish his promise. This is sounding very familiar to another father and another only son sacrificed on Mount Moriah. 
Abraham knew, listen, if God tells me to sacrifice my son, it's not going to change the promise that a great nation is going to come through him because God can raise him from the dead. That's why Abraham takes up such a big part of the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So for three days, also a significant number, for three days during which Abraham considered his son dead, for three days they walked to the place of sacrifice. It's a story you should read in Genesis 22. They came to Mount Moriah. They came to the place. They built the altar together. Isaac laid down on the altar at will. He was an older uh, young man, is the, the Hebrew there. Some believe he was 33, but speculation for sure. But Isaac lays down. Abraham ties him to the altar, raises the knife. And just as he's about to plunge the knife into his son, the angel of the Lord calls out to him, right? Abraham, Abraham. And he stops him. Here's the big point. Genesis 22, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering, here's the word you want to underline, instead of his son. All right, what's the chance at this point that Abraham fully understands and fully appreciates the concept of a substitutionary sacrifice? You think God made a point here? <laughs> With a split second to spare, man. I'm glad Abraham wasn't, didn't have a quick trigger finger. Of course, it wouldn't have stopped. The knife would have just like, ah, couldn't have gone into Isaac. But uh, listen, God taught the father of the faith the importance of a substitutionary sacrifice in Genesis 22. And when you read through Genesis 22 and really absorb it, you just all through it, you go, that's about Jesus. That's about Jesus. This is about, this is about the heavenly father and Jesus. And it seems so clear to us that so we wonder how anybody can miss it. But the point today is that God taught Abraham about substitutionary sacrifice and taught him that that sacrifice of a substitute was his answer. Listen, here's the deal. Abraham's son was required to die. Listen carefully. Abraham's son was required to die because of God's judgment. And God allowed an innocent animal, an innocent life, to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. Does it make sense? All right, you understand I'm talking about Genesis, right? Long before the law. It's really, really important. Do you remember two messages ago? We did the Passover. What was it that was substituted for the lives of the firstborn in the houses of Israel in the tenth plague in Egypt that leads up to the Passover, that is the Passover? What was it? It was a lamb. It was a lamb without spot or blemish that was brought into the house and loved by the family and then slain with the kids watching and then its blood put in the sign of a cross over the door so that the angel of death would pass over that house. Listen, guys, God's plan of redemption through a substitutionary sacrifice that atones for our sin is not a New Testament concept. It's an Old Testament concept. It's a Genesis concept. When we get to the book of Leviticus, it's really rolling. The whole substitutionary sacrifice thing is just out of control. Most people don't like Leviticus. We, we um, threaten people. If you mess with me, I'll teach Leviticus right here, okay? Uh, <laughs> we threaten people with Leviticus. Why? Because they say Leviticus is smeared with blood start to finish. There is so much blood in Leviticus, it turns us off. We don't like the idea of blood. In fact, there are some with, with you know, maybe, well, I won't say because those some might be here. But there are some that would say, really? God would kill an innocent lamb? And they would question God like, here's what Leviticus teaches us. Our sin is serious. And there are serious consequences of our sin. Death is required. God's holiness and God's judgment requires ultimate separation between a holy God and a sinful man. 
it's death. The ultimate separation from between you and God is death. Sin requires death. We don't like the seriousness of sin. We don't like the consequences of our sin. And so we overlook the book of Leviticus. We just say, well, you know, the book of Leviticus is all about that stuff. And it is true that the book of Leviticus lays out the civil laws and the moral ethical laws and the governmental laws for Israel. But more than anything else, Leviticus proves to us to us that sin requires the shedding of blood. Are you in Leviticus? All right, Leviticus, we're going to do 16, but just look down one chapter. In chapter 17 of Leviticus, there's a key verse, and this is the second thing we have to understand. What we just did is we made substitutionary sacrifice very clear through the life of Abraham and Isaac, right? All right, now look at Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar, underline this, to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Critically important that we understand this term, atonement. Because God says very clearly in Leviticus, while there's just blood, absolutely a sea of blood surrounding Israel from the sacrifices, God says, I've given you the blood on the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So the best way to remember atonement, though, uh, we, we never um, dissect English words in, in Bible study um, because, you know, newsflash, uh, the Bible wasn't written in English. Um, but it's a good way to remember it. Atonement uh, really does come from two English words, the English word atonement. It comes from at one minute. And so it is okay to say atonement. The best way for you to remember it is at one minute meaning atonement puts you at one with God. It returns you to a right relationship with God. Does it make sense? Very important that we understand this term atonement. Because why? Because atonement is God's method of reconciling us to Himself. Our sin separates us from God. And God created us to have relationship with Him. And so God had to create a way. And, and it wasn't a second thought. It was created even before the fall because God's outside of time. And don't get me started on all that. God knew all along. And so His plan to reconcile you from your sin is through a atonement which puts you in right standing with God. The process of atonement is a substitutionary sacrifice. It's a life put in, the, in place of yours so that God, as Romans says, is both the just and the justifier. He keeps His justice. He keeps His holiness. He keeps His righteousness because He brings judgment upon your sin. But He's allowed a substitutionary sacrifice to take that penalty so that you can be made right at one with God. This is when you say amen. Listen, this stuff isn't by chance, man. God worked all this out so that you can have an intimate relationship with Him. That's His whole goal. That's His goal is for you to be His children. For you to walk with Him. For you to spend eternity with Him. I don't know what He sees in you. But He loves you so much. He loves us so much that He made a way for us to be restored and reconciled to Him instead of judged and separated from Him for eternity. Here's the deal. Again, I know I'm repeating myself. Our sin violates the holiness of God. That violation requires judgment from God, a sentence of separation. That sentence of separation can only be averted by God's full judgment falling on a life. God allows that life to be substituted for ours, a substituted life in place of ours. And so God's judgment is met. We're restored to a right relationship. That's atonement for the second or third time. It's God's solution to our problem. It's God's solution to our problem. Here's the deal, all right? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. And now listen, I love my mother very much. I, I, I love her. I would die ten times for her. 
But she raised me saying, you know what, David? All religions are the same. And when I got saved at 19 years old, she's like, why are you caught up in that one? Why don't you check out the other couple hundred religions? Don't get all like narrow-minded. And, and eventually what I told her was, listen, Mom, there's no other religion on earth like this one. There is no other God on earth that has sacrificed his own son in my place so that his judgment could be poured out so that I could be made right with him and live for an eternity. If there was another religion that compared to this one, I'd look into it. Amen. There's not. This is God's plan. He is the only true God, the only creator. This is his only plan. So we don't like the blood. We don't like the seriousness of our sin. We don't like the consequences of our sin because we think too highly of ourselves. And we don't realize, you know, God, something has to die. Somebody, ultimately, has to die in order for you to receive me. Because my sin is heinous to you. So imagine you're living in Israel. Imagine this constant routine of having to bring an animal to the priest and, and really the head of the household in most cases would slit the animal's throat himself for, on behalf of his family. And so year after year, you're draining the blood of these animals. There's animals just dead everywhere. This is what we call an object lesson. Right? You ever been around a slaughterhouse? Oh, man, it's rough. It's rough. How about those slaughterhouse trucks? Or like, I know, I know. I don't want to make anybody cry. But, you know, they, they bring the trucks in to, to take the dead animals away. When that truck's about three miles away, all the animals get jittery because they can smell the death coming. I mean, it's a stench. Are you try being out in the desert for, say, 40 years Killing animals constantly. Uh, it, it's an object lesson. Don't get too caught up with, well, how, where'd they get them? How did they, you know, they were there. They were there. God made sure they had them. Time after time, you're watching animals die as a graphic reminder of the seriousness of your sin. And ultimately, if you have your thoughts straight, you're glad it's the animal and not you. Really, in the end, you say, yeah, God, that's, 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 the blood is awful, but I'm glad it's the animals and not mine. So, the most famous picture of atonement in the Old Testament is a day that all Jews, I, I guess, all religious Jews at least, if not all Jews, uh, still celebrate today. You know the day, right? It's called, it's called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, what does it stand for? Janet? Janet's like back there crying because she recognizes how real this stuff is. It's a day of atonement. Atonement in Hebrew? Kippur. Yom day. The day of atonement. Yom Kippur. You've heard of this, right? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16. Here's the three things I wanted you to write down. I'm going to put them on the screen because they're so important because I have to just blaze through them. Genesis 22, Leviticus 16, and Hebrews 9 and 10. I'll give you the verses in a minute. These three chapters tie together substitutionary sacrifice and atonement end to end in the Bible. Leviticus 16 starts out with very detailed instructions about how the high priest is supposed to approach the presence, the holiness of God. And it's really neat because it's done in reference to Aaron's own two sons who if, hey, hey, have you ever known anybody that says me and God got our own thing going on? Like, okay, you can, you can approach God your way, I'll approach God in my way. Here's the chapter you want to take him to. It's Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, Aaron, the high priest, had two sons. Anybody know their name? They're fun names. It's Nadab and Abihu. And, and Nadab and Abihu were Aaron's sons, and they decided to approach God on their own terms, and so God killed them. I don't know what that means. you got to figure it out yourself. God gave instructions for how to approach him. Aaron's own sons approached him on their own terms, so God killed them. And hopefully there's a lesson in there. Somewhere. 
That's not the point. Leviticus 16 spells out the Day of Atonement. The high priest goes through this incredible process of, of preparing to enter into the presence of of God. There were always sacrifices, especially on festival days as the festivals were instituted, but the Day of Atonement was the big day. This is the big daddy day of atonement. So here's, here's where it happened. In the wilderness, there was the tabernacle. And I would love for you to study the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, there was a room designated by the, the details given from God to Moses. There was an inner room called the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, people have different images of the Ark, so I always like to remind them, uh, the Ark's only like four feet long by about two feet wide. So it's a box about like this, a very ornate box. Inside the box, among a couple other things, is the Ten Commandments, the second set of tablets that God wrote for Moses that he didn't break in his little fit when the people were just making golden calves and dancing around naked. Uh, so the, read about it. It's in Exodus. Uh, so the second set is in the Ark of the Covenant. It represents the holiness and the judgment of God, the law. On top of the Ark of the Covenant is a solid gold lid called the mercy seat. Follow me. Holy of holies, presence of God inside the tabernacle, inside the holy place. Ark of the covenant, inside is God's law, righteous requirement for holiness. On top of a golden lid called the mercy seat. On top of the golden mercy seat, two cherubim that are touching wings. And in between the cherubim, on top of the mercy seat, is the Shekinah glory of God. God dwelt with his people. We'll talk about it next week. And this is where he dwelt. That's the picture. So once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest prepares himself. First thing he does is he slaughters an animal for his own sins. And then he's going to slaughter an animal for the sins of the people. And he's going to go in and address God in the Holy of Holies. Let me just put on the screen, because I did make a, a slide for it. If you're a reader, read this book written by a, a good Messianic Jew named David Levy. The book is The Tabernacle, Shadows of the Messiah. Many years ago, we taught a message uh, called uh, The Tabernacle, Pictures of Christ, and it was taken from this book. So it's a great, great book. I'd encourage you to read it. It'll blow your mind to see the typology and the pictures of Christ in the tabernacle blow your mind. Leviticus 16 verse 6. I have to talk this fast. We're covering three of the biggest chapters in the Bible today. This is out of control, man. Leviticus 16 verse 6. Here's the summary of the Day of Atonement. Okay, listen carefully. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. There's our Hebrew word, kippur, atonement, the day of atonement. Verse 7, then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Watch carefully now, this is cool. Verse 8, and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Azazel. The second goat became known as the scapegoat. Who said that? Nice. The second goat, Azazel, it became known as the scapegoat. Watch carefully how it works now. Uh, verse 9. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. That means kill it. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Now, let me just review for you real quick. The high priest first sacrifices a bull after a long prep uh, ceremony, sacrifices the bull for his own sins, takes the blood in, and smears it, at very, very least sprinkles it on the gold mercy seat that is between, listen carefully, I'm making a point here, that is between the presence of God and the righteous requirements of the law. The gold mercy seat is covered with blood for the high priest. And then he goes back out, the goat that, that, that you might say loses the 
the roll of the dice, uh, the casting of lots, that goat is slain, and the blood of that goat is brought back into the presence of God and is smeared on the mercy seat between the presence of God and the righteous requirements of the law. So let me just let me just point out the picture in the Holy of Holies, and we'll go back to the Azazel. From where God sits in his Shekinah glory, looking down upon the Ark of the Covenant where his righteous requirements are, he sees the mercy seat, which is Christ, the type of Christ, and on the mercy seat he sees blood that atones for the sins of the people. And so instead of looking down at the righteous requirements of the law, he's looking down at the blood that's smeared on the mercy seat to make atonement for the people. Amen! Now you're saying, isn't that isn't that Jesus Christ? Isn't that what happened with Jesus Christ? And I'm saying, yeah, it happened in Leviticus. That's when it happened. It's a big deal. So, the Azazel, the other goat. Tradition says they would tie a red uh, string around this goat's neck so they, they would not sacrifice the wrong goat. Afterwards, the high priest would come out, lay his hands on the Azazel, the scapegoat, symbolically transferring the sin of the people onto the scapegoat, and then the scapegoat would be taken away into the wilderness and led out to the wilderness until it could never return. Like as far as the east is from the west. And so not only do the people see the blood sacrifice atoning for their sin in the presence of God, but they see the scapegoat carrying their sins off into the wilderness never to return. <laughs> That's cool, man. Listen, this God stuff just didn't, we just didn't make this stuff up. <laughs> there, there's no other religion in the world, man. It's had one consistent plan of God for thousands of years written down. Man, it's a big deal. Le Leviticus 16, read it. The day of, the day of Atonement, not the only time there were sacrifices, but the big time. All throughout the, the life of the nation of Israel, animals were being sacrificed. Why? Because no one single sacrifice of an animal could sufficiently or permanently atone for sin. It was a cover over until the next animal was sacrificed. The penalty was never satisfied. The Jewish historians, number of them, write about the temple on the top of the Kidron Valley on the Temple Mount. Uh, they ran two drains from the altar, the brazen altar where uh, the, um, the animals were sacrificed, two drains down into the Kidron Valley, which separates the, the Temple Mount from the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a brook, Kidron, that runs through there. And a number of the Jewish historians talk about on festival days, there were so many sacrifices in the temple that the Kidron Valley ran red with blood because they would use water to wash the blood down from the altar to get it down the slope to the Kidron Valley, to the Brook Kidron. And so they're just dead animals piling up everywhere around the temple, and the Kidron Valley's running red with blood. And the people understand the seriousness of their sin. And still their sin is only temporarily covered over. Not ultimately, not permanently, not completely. It had to be repeated year after year, festival after festival. But listen to me, please. You know this is where I'm going to close. Every single one of those sacrifices, so many millions we couldn't begin to count, every one pointed to the final sacrifice of atonement, the final substitutionary sacrifice, the final day of atonement. They all pointed to who? Say it. They all pointed to Jesus. They all pointed to Jesus. Since Genesis chapter 3, God has been pointing His people to Jesus Christ. Turn over to Hebrews for me, and we'll end there. Oh, this just gives you so much confidence when you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about documents that have been in writing the very least 3,000 years. 66 books, 40 authors on three continents, and one single story. No religion on earth compares 
to the message that God has for you. Hebrews chapter 9, all of God's plan of redemption culminates, finalizes, concludes in Jesus Christ. Here's the actual verses. I keep referring to Hebrews 9 and 10. Here's the actual verses. Write them down. It's Hebrews 9, 11 to 10, 25. 9-11 to 10-25, read them. Now, for the sake of time to prevent me from having to explain them too much, I'm going to do it out of the NLT. I'm trying not to read too much out of the NLT so you're not like, oh, what's, what Bible is he going to use today? Um, not that you guys talk like that. Uh, but I speed everything up in my mind. Um, so I'm trying to use the ESV, but I have to use the NLT here because I just don't have time to explain it all, and the NLT does a great job. So follow me. Follow on the screen. Remember, we're talking about the Day of Atonement. We're talking about substitutionary sacrifice, Day of Atonement, the tabernacle, the process that God instituted in Leviticus 16 to atone for the sins of the people in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Are you with me? All right, Hebrews chapter 9 is talking about that. Here we go. Hebrews 9 verse 11. So Christ has now become the high priest. Remember, we're talking about the high priest, the tabernacle, day of atonement. Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. Verse 12, with his own blood. Not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Oh, man. <laughs> I get it. The day of atonement in the tabernacle and the holy of holies and the blood that was splattered on the mercy seat. It was all about Jesus Christ who entered not a type of the tabernacle, but the actual tabernacle in heaven. Not a type of the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt, but into the actual presence, the actual throne room of God. And not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood, he bought our redemption forever. I, man. I don't know what God sees in us. But I know He had a heck of a plan to make us right and to draw us into His presence and to have relationship with us. It's a big deal. Okay, I'm going to read this big stretch in Hebrews 9. I, I can't teach it as well as God wrote it, so I'm just going to read it. Hebrews 9, verse 23. Follow me or listen carefully. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. Verse 25, And He did not enter heaven to offer Himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. Verse 26, If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, He has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by His own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment, look at verse 28. So also Christ died once for all time, as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Listen, if you're one of those many right now, just raise your hand and say amen. 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 Because listen, somebody has to die for your sin. 
The judgment of God must be poured out or God cannot be God. He cannot overlook your sin. He cannot excuse your sin. Your sin must be paid for. And if you are one who has received it, which the reference here to to Jesus Christ taking away the sins of many people, it means all those who will receive it. No, there is no limit. No one is kept out. All who will receive it. Jesus Christ will atone for your sins by His own substitutionary sacrifice because it's the only sacrifice that will once and for all pay the full penalty required by God for your sin. Do you see there's no other way here? Do you see that really you, you, God can't just say, well, you're a pretty good person, I think I'm going to let you in? God must judge your sin. He did judge your sin. And it is finished. Te telestai. Look at the end of verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Listen, Jesus came once to deal with your sin. When he comes back, he's not coming back to deal with your sin anymore. He's coming back to snatch you out of this world and take you home. Amen? (laughs) Amen. Because it's finished, man. It's finished. The price has been paid. Your sins have been atoned for. God allowed you to receive a substitutionary sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin. All you have to do is receive it. Every act of sacrifice and atonement in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. Every act. Because God's plan of redemption was always looking forward to Christ. Was always setting the stage for Jesus Christ. It's never changed since the day sin entered the world. And through the law, and through Leviticus, and through the life of Israel, we clearly see that God's holy justice requires Sacrifice for atonement. Ultimately, God has made only one way for you to be made right with Him. Only one way for you to become at one with Him. It's through a substitutionary sacrifice that leads to atonement to making you right. That sacrifice is the Son of God. It's God in the flesh. It's Jesus Christ. And through 1,500 years of the Old Testament, He made it clear that somebody had to die for you to not have to. And in the New Testament, He came. And He says to God, you didn't desire the sacrifice of the bulls or the rams, but a body you've prepared for Me. And I've come to do Your will. And He came to be the final sacrifice for you and for me. He came to die so that we don't have to. And I want you to know that whatever way you think you're going to be made right with God, if it's not Jesus Christ, forget about it. Forget about it. Because He's the only way that God's made to atone for your sin to give you right standing with Him. You have got to decide to put your full faith and trust in God's only plan of redemption because He's only made one. It cost Jesus Christ His life. And He freely offers it to you by faith. If you've never made that commitment, right now is the time to do it. Don't leave here not knowing if you're right with God. Let's pray. Lord God, right now, we just, Lord, Lord, we've just, we've just surveyed so much information, God. Clarify it in our minds, Lord. Help us to see that, that since Abraham and Isaac, you proved the concept of substitutionary sacrifice, one death so that another wouldn't have to die. And through Leviticus and the Day of Atonement, you've proved that atonement for our sins can only be through the sacrifice of blood. And Jesus, in You, we see the ultimate atonement, the ultimate sacrifice. And right now, if you've never put your faith in that, if you think that something else is going to make you right with God, right now I need you to grasp the severity of your sin and the the intensity of God's plan to remedy your sin. And I want you to cry out to Him right now and say, Lord, 
I'm sorry for thinking I was good enough to stand in your presence, God. (laughs) I'm such a fool. I know I deserve judgment, Lord. I know my sin deserves judgment. And right now, Lord, I receive the substitutionary sacrifice of Your own Son, Jesus. Jesus, I receive You. I receive the price You paid for my sin. I receive You as my Savior. And I surrender my life to You as Lord. I recognize that one doesn't come without the other. And so I turn from my sin that You died to pay for. I turn to You. Come into my life. Fill me. Fill me with Your Holy Spirit. And make me a disciple, Lord. Now, while you guys keep praying, I feel like there's some here that need to make a commitment. To make, need to make more of a more than a prayer commitment. And so, if you come here a bit, you know I don't do this often. But I'm going to ask you right now that if you've never taken a stand for Jesus Christ, I need you to do that today. I just want you to stand up where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come forward today, though you're welcome to come to the cross and fall on your face in the correct posture before the Lord. But I want you to at least get used to taking a stand for Christ. I believe somebody needs to do that. So I'm just going to give you a minute to do that while you, we keep praying. If that's you today. If you need to make a stand for Christ in a public place, I'm giving you the easiest possible way to do it. Because there's a day coming where it's going to cost you greatly to stand for Christ. I just want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. If you've never stood for Him, stand for Him now. Say, Lord, I'm in. I'm all in. I receive Your sacrifice in my place. I receive You into my life as Savior. I make You my Lord. I'm not playing around. I'm not turning back. I'm not walking the fence. It's too serious. Just giving you an opportunity. you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Mm. Look, I don't mean to get too personal. But if you're struggling with sin and you're walking the fence... It's time to get used to taking a stand for Christ and being radical about your faith and standing up against the pressures of your own flesh and against the pressures of the world. Every time you stand for Christ, it'll be easier to stand for Him next time. Every time you don't when you know you should, it'll be easier for you not to the next time. Why don't you two guys walk up here for me? Or you guy and girl. 
should say. You get a couple of elders up here praying with me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord Jesus, we stand for you. Against, Lord, the struggles, against the fears, against the unknown, in the deepest seas, Lord. We stand for you, Jesus. We stand for you. Against all odds, Lord, we stand for you. With a commitment, Lord, to turn from sin, to turn from our own ways. We just stand for you, Lord. And having done all, God, we continue to stand. We pray, Lord, that you would clothe us in your armor. That we would be able, Lord, to stand against the attacks of the enemy. Give us all we need in you, Jesus. To stand strong in the battle, to not be taken out. To be a testimony of your power and your grace, Lord. We surrender it all to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.